Shupo's remarkable journey through Wizard 101 continued. Merle Ambrose revealed his mysterious past, Malastare made a surprising return, and Morganth the Shadow Queen proved to be a mighty challenge. Through many battles, some victorious and some humbling, with newly found allies, Chupo once again saved the spiral. However, Chupo made the fatal error of reviving a long-forgotten threat. Will he be able to bring peace once more, or will the ways of the past finally catch up to the wizarding world? So next up is Arc 3. This is a continuation of Old Cobb's Purple right at the end of Arc 2. To put it simply, the Spiral's in danger once again. Overall, he's just unhappy with the Spiral. He sent some of his evil purples to three worlds, Polaris, Mirage, and Imperia. And the initial goal is just to stop that. And with that in mind, let's get right into not doing that. Yep. Side content, there's side content still, and even though it's labeled as side content, I don't really think it's fair to also sideline it. This stuff is way more than just some side quests that very occasionally have story tidbits. These are specifically like dungeons and raids, like entire areas designed to do certain activities. And I didn't do them. Okay, well that's not true. I did some of the stuff in this bunch of wizardry, but the quests aren't fully mandatory. Some of the other wizard kids did them. I just didn't really want to, nor that I feel like I needed to. It's mostly just bonus dungeons and raids that are available at certain points in the game. And it's not like Grizzleheim or Wisteria where going over it objectively matters. You know, we've covered most of them, and a lot of these dungeons are just going back to previous areas and attempting to do them again. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna very briefly go over all of the most important side content right now, just so the rest of this lovely little adventure can be focused on the main game and the main story. First off, House of Scales. Al has read The Balance Professor all the way back from Crocotopia has been studying the Crocodomicon after I got it from Malster at the end of Arc 1. Al has read and his new assistant Alina are deciphering a chapter of the Nomicon titled the Croco Cypha. But then there's a crime in an upside down pyramid. Turns out this guy named Ahmet the Devourer is trying to eat souls of anyone he can, so that gets stopped. Next up in Marleybone, we got Barkingham Palace, there's a really uncool dude, Dr. Jackals, trying to turn everyone into a monster. This requires going to the Queen of Marleybone, who is a corgi, and saving the day, so th so that gets stopped. And Kimbalang, Major Talbot from Krakatobi, is freaking out because some of his guys went missing there. Turns out this rotten bad guy, Tenkatsu, is trying to use the bodies of one of them to bring back an evil monster, McGee. So that gets stopped. In Avalon, there's the Catacombs. I went there partially. I don't care. I never finished it, but there's more here. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to do it. Aquila is a really cool place. This is a mythological world where wizards get invited to compete in the immortal games, where you fight the spiral Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. I don't know why they're scary, muscly birds, but they are. This was a fun one. I liked it. It was short and sweet, and there's even backstory here. So a few years back, actually, no, gonna pull the plug on that. This is a Pirate 101 world, like a fully explored Pirate 101 location. And in here, it's just a bonus. So guess what, dweebos? I'm not gonna cover it. Maybe when the day comes to do a Pirate 101 adventure, I'll go back. You know, I'm all right being a wizard for the time being, so I'm not gonna talk about Zeus just yet. Love this area, though. I really hope it's not bad in that game. And then there's, in my opinion, the most important one. There's Darkmoor. Do you remember back in Azteca when Malastare did that thing where he fell into the infinite cold abyss we all know and love as the depths of space? Yeah, so he survives that. And let me just say, he's pretty freaking peeved about me existing with my skin and vital organs still intact. So he crash lands on the scary land of Darkmoor where Dwargan used to live. It's funny seeing how these two have grown up in different ways. Good for Dwargan. He's, he's, he's doing very good for himself. At this point, Malastare, since the end of Arc 1, his entire existence has been tragically hilarious. He went from being content with moving to the afterlife with his late wife, then in arc 2 he gets revived by Morganth and then decides, the wife can wait, I want to kill a child. So then, you know, he gets dropped into space, spends like a year floating out there, and now he's hanging out with werewolves and zombies. Meanwhile, his wife Sylvia is watching him go on this crusade about ending the lives of children and wondering to herself how she married this man. He like really wants me gone. Not only does he cast this thing called the Law of Khan Devasi that forcefully binds me into a 
eventually having to fight him to the death, but he gets everyone there to fight for him. For example, he convinces the vampire lord Shane Bonshane with the claim that he can revive and bring back dead people. And this is obviously a lie. The only reason he got revived was because Morganth got very, very, very fortunate with her attack on Azteca. I think Lord Shane Von Shane specifically is just a dumb extra side character. This is his castle he is willing to let be destroyed because if Malastare succeeds, Shane was pinky promised, even though Malastare crossed his fingies, that a girl he liked named Tatiana would get revived. Shane seems like a really nice guy. Too bad nice guys always finish last and Tatiana hates Shane so much that even as a ghost, she wants to help the wizards win. She does not want to come back to life. I'm not even kidding. Her hate of Shane is so powerful it takes down his associates. I ended up fighting this optional plant fight for 40 minutes. I don't know why I did it. I thought it would be funny. I regret it now. But at the end of Darkmoor, a third and final confrontation with Malastare comes. And it was an intense and hard battle where Malastare pulled out all the stops, did the best he could, and he can't do it. He loses, and it's to the death again. Malastare Drake, the Undying, the former death professor of Ravenwood Academy, is dead again. He's disappointed that the spiral has worked against his favor. Again. And then Sylvia returns and says, Dude, we just went through this. Can we go back to Wizard Heaven? They have like Strawberry Fago up there in foosball tables. Why are we not up there? And then Malastare, once again, this time permanently, unblinded by his hate and distaste of the spiral, apologizes and prepares to move on, promising that he is done once and for all, and that we will never see him on the living plane again. And you know what? I like this ending. I think it's nice that it's actually completed after all this time. I think one thing lost in this video I can't fully articulate is how long each of these stories in game take to actually be told. Dragon Spire happens in 2010, and then he gets revived in 2014. It takes him four years, nearly half a decade, to get revived and to get this far. And you have to respect the fans who stayed committed to the world after all this time. Of course, a lot of these more important characters have stories that need to be told. And despite how unfortunate a good amount of Malastare's story has been, along with him doing things I definitely don't agree with, don't think I forgot about Death School, it really is truly nice to see an entire character go through their story and to be able to say goodbye to them, especially one who's been there since the very beginning. Like, Malastare has gotten the most screen time out of any character, even Merle, who is the mascot. So goodbye, Malastare. I'm glad you had proper closure a second time. At least it's better than Morganth, who has had closure zero times. Canonically, she is still floating in space as a spider person, but in a decade, she might be dead, I don't know, why can you summon her in a spell? It feels like a plot hole, this feels- this doesn't feel right, why can you do this? So back at Ravenwood, Ambrose has something kind of important to tell me. I- 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 I graduated. I mean, when you think about it, that makes sense. In-universe, the game has been around for roughly seven years, so people who have been playing since the start, by technicality, have gone through middle school and high school. That's seven years, and I think it's fair to graduate, but at this point in my own story, it was only like four months. I can't help but feel like I did exclusively questing, and because of that, I got a cheap excuse to fully miss the experiences that come with being a student. So I personally don't feel like I deserve it, you know? Allegedly off-screen when you're not playing the game, the wizard characters are like studying and doing all the things a wizard should. So maybe he had some like Wreck-It Ralph off adventures with some other wizards we don't know about. I wouldn't know. All that I do know is that after all my time at Ravenwood, they still haven't put the death school back. The graveyard's like one of the worst places to have a school building, but at least I have one. Sorry, Balance School. That's what you get for having Margaret Thatcher be in the Balance School. This this is canon. Every school has official celebrities connected with them. But yeah, it's a nice ceremony. All the staff, the council, really just every magical non-student we have encountered. And they all agree that saving the spiral from two major threats, along with a couple dozen minor ones, is worth a diploma. All of Ravenwood shuts down for the occasion. In fact, nobody else shows up besides the people we have met along the journey. Merle gives us the thing, Dwargan celebrating his successful student, suddenly. The tree starts coughing. This is the catalyst toward the next major portion of our journey. See, Bartleby's got a case of the dying disease. Maybe there's radiation in the teleporting doors, or maybe Malastare had cooties or something and gave it to Bartleby when stealing his eye. That could explain why his wife died also. A few of the professors try helping out. The cow one, even though she's a life wizard, is unable to help Bartleby. Then Cyrus tells us that we are once again going to have to go to the farthest corner of the spiral, just like Chrysalis and where coincidentally Old Cobb sent one of his evil purples. In Polaris.
The main objective of Polaris is to find Old Cobb's Purple of Polaris along with finding Cyrus's old friend Baba Yaga. She might be able to help out Bartleby. The only problem is she's gonna be hard to find. And then that takes us to the real start of Old Cobb's story. From here on out, there's a definite shift in almost every corner of this game. I wouldn't necessarily say this speaks for everything the game has to offer, but I would say the content in these next few worlds have a lot more substance. Like, there's still moments where things happen just to happen, but then there's also a good amount of times that exist to justify why some of these things are happening. Fighting becomes more tolerable, specifically for solo gameplay. Just in general, though, I will say the game feels a bit better. Polaris is a second attempt at a snow area after Winter Tusk, and I like this one. And I thought this was an above average area. There's this one guy on the official subreddit who goes on a lot of the posts and says, Polaris, best world. I hope you're doing well, by the way. Also, no. But let me at least say, Arc 3 is the best Wizard 101 will get. Best difficulty, good area variety, story has a lot of memorable moments. It's not just Polaris, but it's a very good start. I won't lie though, I did not really like the first third of Polaris. Ignoring all the overarching content, I'm introduced to another attempt of the game making polar bears and then also some penguins. The backstory of this world is just France. An important spiral figure by the name of Napoleon Gwyn, guess who he's based on, was attacking the spiral worlds based specifically on the spiral worlds that share traits with all the ones in Europe. Then he falls to Marleybone, and then the Pirate 101 location Valencia is where the horses live. They also don't like Napoleon Gwyn. Remember the horses. Recently though, the penguins that go by penguins have fallen under the rule of Empress and Tusket, and they want me to stop that because that means I can't really travel to the rest of Polaris. Events here include a Boston tea party, fighting, talking, more fighting, discovering the villain of this area is named Rasputin, and meeting Baba Yaga's friend Ivan the Great, who wouldn't you know, is pretty good and not too bad I'd say as of right now. And with Ivan, I go up to the Empress, hit her with the one two stern talking to. Long story short, I overthrow a monarchy in three hours. And this area sets up the future, very nice, it just wasn't my cup, it was just kind of boring. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not all for historical uh, resistance stories, I know that's like a very specific niche, but um, this falls into it, didn't li didn't really care. But with their freedom, we are now able to adventure into the further depths of Polaris, and walking through the winter woods, there's some stuff all around. The best, of course, being a vegetarian yeti named Zoot. He has a backwards hat and treats others how he wants to be treated. I remember him more than anything that happened to me in Mushu. I am confronted by a new character, Malari. I don't want to go into that much detail, but her personality and existence as a whole just boils down to something like this Venn diagram. I'd say that's derogatory. As it turns out, Malari's guardian just so happens to be Baba Yaga. At first, she's like this generic old lady witch who's brewing like a cauldron and trying to cook Hansel and Gretel into an oven until Bartleby the dying tree comes into conversation. Then she locks in and all of a sudden I'm in this like magic thingy as old as Bartleby called the Oracle. Um, what? Oh yeah, also, uh, we find out that Old Cobb, the, this guy. Also, um, do you remember Grandfather Spider? The guy who got divorced at the very beginning with Grandmother Raven and was like stuck in sleep and had his heart ripped out and all of that stuff? Yeah, that's Old Cobb. That guy who helped create the spiral and destroyed the first world. This, this is Grandfather Spider. This is the final guy from the original six we needed to find. So needless to say, after waking up and seeing that the first world has become the spiral, he's unhappy with it to say the very least. So he sent out the evil purples all across the spiral to increase his chances of one of them being able to take over that respective world and then, you know, like spread across everywhere else. And to make matters even more of a challenge, Spider's evil purples have all disguised themselves as natives of their respective worlds. For example, Polaris's villain, Rasputin, he disguised himself as the rat. He helped enslave the penguins, and after the penguins overthrew the disgusting walrus queen, is currently using an entire town's worth of penguins to mine some Borealis gemstones, which he's gonna use for bad reasons. That's bad, there's also a moose, but Rasputin gets away on his very slow boat after taking control of Ivan the moderately above average. Baba Yaga hears that Rasputin has managed to sail away after we try to go in the mines and stop him. We're failures. And Baba Yaga begins to say in her witchy witch voice perhaps one of the most important lines in this entire franchise. I'm a witch! Ooh, I have a broomstick! Hey, little boy, do you want to go to college? What? <laughs> 
Oh boy, time for a new major location. This is the Arcanum, and the Arcanum is, for the remainder of this, essentially just the new Ravenwood. Like, there's new spells and professors, but this time, they're allegedly the best of the best of the spiral. And it's not just like Merle's sloppy seconds, but I won't lie, I'm gonna miss going to Wizard City so often. I mean, wizard teleportation means I can get there in like two minutes, but still, now I gotta learn about all these guys and their backstories and whatever. And to give an idea, one of the wizards is a Celestian, and reminder, they died, they aren't messing around, around here they they straight up just have these mythical masterminds all these incredible people and now I'm one of them. Here at the Arcanum, hand-picked wizards and staff research the best ways to protect the spiral from the dangers inside and outside of it. Now besides the Celestian and Baba Yaga, there's a plenty of new faces that I'm sure have plenty of story, but unfortunately there there's not as much love for this bunch. It's not like Ravenwood professors where they've been around since the start, and you don't have to play 150 hours of the game to get there. I guess it is kind of like college though, it feels like I'm kind of thrusted into the Arcanum without many familiar faces along for the ride. And each major wizard here is from one of the different major schools. The Storm one, who I'm gonna call Ion, I think that's right, I don't know, it's been a while, is the only one who really matters in almost all of this Arcanum stuff. She isn't too happy about me existing here and whatever after the Morganth incident specifically. Baba Yaga wasn't around for about 15 years and then came back with me and her weird claymation child. In the end of the Arcanum, I become a pledge for this hellish wizard frat. And Ion notes how weird it is that I know all the forbidden shadow magic. Just in general, the shadow magic is like this taboo thing and not everyone is a big fan of that. Thanks Morgan. Um, oh yeah, I also have shadow magic from Chrysalis, so I guess that's a problem on my part. The guilt starts balling up in Finnegan Jacko Boots. All of our wacky misadventures so far are revealed to the Arcanum and the wizards are just like conflicted that I did everything for them. Like, good job Finnegan, you stopped World War One. All it took was starting World War Two. Me freeing Grandfather Spider to stop Morganth protects the spiral as much as it puts it back into danger. So obviously they're really upset that now it's their problem. And Grandmother Raven shows up for a bit as well. And, um... She's not good anymore. She's unhappy with the spiral and old Cobb and all this fighting and now she's an enemy And there's this touch I think is really neat because Grandmother Raven being the narrator of this story whenever there was a specific action The developers didn't want to animate. She's not the narrator anymore We don't have one anymore the angel on her shoulder the guide who has been there since the beginning who has watched every portion of our quest is now an enemy and it adds to the loneliness It adds to the conflict and we'll get into Grandma Raven's motives in a minute but it's really impactful just seeing how far this character changes. It bothers me how invested I am now and I'm moving on. Back in Polaris, Ivan, Malari, and all the penguins who revolted earlier are trying to find Rasputin. The whole gang storms in on these Borealis gemstone creatures Rasputin's made, and then everyone sails over to a mountain he fled off to. And not too much of a shock, he's got a micro army. Scaling the mountain, Ivan the Wonderful stays behind to hold off some additional fights. And so Malari joins us as we actually confront Rasputin as he transforms into the rat. And, and he sure plays like one. This fight took four people and gimmicks by intentionally using weak cards. This was a hilariously close fight and it didn't need to be. This is just a thing you gotta deal with. Whenever looking at quest logs, whenever a boss is labeled cheats, you just gotta clasp your hands and pray or else you're gonna lose a couple hours to something that looks like this. The finale fights in almost every area from now on are genuinely miserable. But hey, we stopped the rat. We stopped the first of the three evil purples and another Another world is saved. Grandfather Spider promises another fight. Ivan gets to eat some like beef stroganoff. The penguins keep being penguins. And most importantly, Baba Yaga enrolls Malari as a Ravenwood student, just like I was. I'm sure this child whose only friends are a polar bear in his mid 30s and Bizarro Gruntilda is gonna do great there. Nothing bad will happen. And as for me, I'm told to rest up and get ready for the next adventure. The Arcanum is gonna need me as much as the rest of the spiral. And will I have the one? the death of Bartleby the magic tree? Well, I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see. Actually, no, we're doing that now. Life Wizard of the Arcanum, Xander, says that Bartleby's feeling even worse than before. Physically and mentally, he's deteriorating, so in hopes of finding ways to mitigate this decay, we decide after eight and a half years since the game's launch, it might just be time to find Bartleby's missing eye. Now, as a reminder, at the very start of our adventure, as we were brought to the school, Malastare stole his right eye, the one that lets him see into the future. Dwargan recommends I take a visit to Malastare's old house in Wizard City and maybe find some clues. Now, this 
specific reason why Malastare stole Bartleby's eye was to make a shady trade. In exchange for that specific eye, a secret group of wizards known as the Cabal provided information on how Malastare could revive his wife, specifically to get the Croconomicon all the way back in Arc 1. During this exchange, both parties talked between one of their agents in Wizard City with the initials of B and G. Suddenly, Duncan shows up! Triton, the Harvest Lord's eating souls, and this little asshole kid named Duncan thinks Malastare's not a bad guy. Seriously, what is this kid's problem? I can see why deaf students don't have a real professor right now. I'm glad you're not going to be plot relevant. After this, I hate you. Son of a bitch! Duncan Grimwater is plot relevant! While I've been working my way up in the happy side of the wizard world, Duncan's been doing that with the bad side. Duncan is doing all this to join the Cabal. Doesn't matter, he gets his legs broken anyway. And there's a lot of new information to process. Before doing anything, I checked on Malari, who's just doing okay after Polaris. She's a life student now. It seems like life in Wizard City is seriously bumming her out. She has no friends, only passing grades, just itching to go on an adventure. But she hasn't been able to because she's too busy spending all of her time doing a face reforming spell. I'd assume Polaris doesn't get much sunlight, so I'm glad to see she is doing a bit better. I don't think the only person who she's interacted with being a canonical baby eater did her any favors, but I wouldn't know. Hey Merle, apparently Malastare, the one guy who I killed two and a half times, gave Bartleby's eyeball to a group called the Cabal. What are you talking about? Merle doesn't know about the Cabal, and nobody does. This is because they got scrubbed from history. Only the Arcanum really knows about them. Not sure how Duncan found himself in cahoots with them, but he did. So before the Arcanum, there was a group of scholars who wanted to make the Arcanum and use it to better study the Spiral. Partway through the construction, about half of them decided that the Spiral was doomed, and instead wanted to use their powers to prepare for a reset and make a better world, or even just bring back the first one. So both parties fought, and in the end, the ones who would become the Cabal lost. And the the winners made the Arcanum we all know and I hope love eventually. This distraught from this whole situation, a kitty cat death wizard who I, I didn't even bother to learn their name this time, informs us we have to go to the next world, Mirage, and find the Eye. And wouldn't you know it, Grandfather Spider's here again. Another double whammy, oh boy! Now Mirage is also a pretty good world for Wizard 101 standards. Personally though, I think this is one of the uglier worlds though. I, I typically don't vibe with how deserts look. Like at this point, I'm numbed by the gameplay loop. It's gonna take a lot more to impress flying carpet chase. Ooh! Now Mirage is cool. This is an adventure and a half though. The first character we meet is the former king named Ozzy. He's just a flying skull, I love Ozzy, top five characters. He's, he's, a, he's a funny guy. Story-wise, I think only like two of these characters are ever important ever again. Mirage used to be ruled by the Babylonians. Uh, that's cute. Um, Ozzy died and his body never moved on. I, I, that, that's all I think. That's... That's all you need to know about all these new guys. There's that one. There's a genie. Yeah, she was nice, I guess. Um, oh yeah, San Diego. Remember this guy for later. This is allegedly just a traveler who wants to make sure everything goes well in Mirage. I won't lie for a moment, they are kind of forgettable, but I assure you, this is somehow a very important character who will come back. Now once again, Grandfather Spider has a child here who's disguised to help out. This time, this time it's a guy named Xerxes. Holy shit, I used to have a horrible lisp growing up, I would not want to pronounce that name. He's gonna be bad and he's trying to take over Mirage. That's a problem! So stumbling over to the city, there are also things wrong there. When, when isn't there? There's a giant thief off, a lot of thieves, a lot of crime. Uh, it's all bad. We meet a little Robin Hood Aladdin pal named Swan, a genie named Istar, the former wife of the King of Thieves, Sultana. They don't like all the bad badness batting around, so our plan becomes a thiefception. By out stealing all of the thieves in the city, we can negotiate with them and, and hopefully attain some level of peace. And then everyone can prepare for the great war against Spider. There's a baboon one. I like Ali Baboon. He's friendshaped, but not full of friendship. This will be important in about 28 seconds. Until then, it's time for traveling around to a bunch of these houses full of Mirage folk in order to convince them to join our cause against Xerxes. He brings an army to the city and then reveals his true form as the Scorpion. Not just a reanimated corpse he was pretending to be. Too bad he loses and it's it's embarrassing. Old cop McGrandfather Spider makes his return, calls his son an epic fail, and then gets rid of the whole army for some reason, which I'm glad for. I personally feel like if he just used them, we would have lost. And it turns out, 
as this was happening, Ali Baboon got his goons to steal the genie that was also not here. Little magic carpet chase, I, I, this is cute, I like this part. Now he's in a Star Wars Jabba the Hutt thing. This next segment is unironically just a giant Star Wars reference. I talk to this guy named Devin, he gives me a scarily disgusting fake camel woman outfit to sneak in, and then after, Ali Baboon already knows we're not a real camel, and then he gets on a live size after a quick couple fights. When rescuing the star, the genie, she reveals that all the important genies like her all have plans they can't share because the haters will sabotage them. And then I have to go into like the genie plane and knock all the truth out of them. They want liberation for the genies. They want freedom and will take it forcefully. This is funny, but as far as I'm concerned, a lot of this world is semi-filler. This is when we learn what the evil plan of the day is. Spider, with the help of the Cabal, are all going to use Bartleby's eye along with some mythical items known as the Chrono Shards to create a sandstorm with some mythical sand referred to as the sands of time. If the storm rages on long enough, the entire spiral, with the exception of them, will bring back the first world through time travel, which will kill almost everyone in the process. And then an onslaught of reveals happen. First off, Duncan was not the agent of the Cabal we were looking for. Instead, it's Greta Darkettle, the, that one witch who I thought surely wasn't important. She helped Malister steal the tree eyeball. To make matters worse, Grandmother Raven finally makes her proper return. For our lovable narrator character, it's crucial that we at least acknowledge what her doings have done. We already know that Grandmother Raven created the spiral. Yeah, that's true. But she also did technically cause everything since then to happen, especially Arc 3, since that's when Grandfather Spider returned to respond to all the things she caused. Now, her goal was to stop Grandfather Spider, and instead to do something equally bad. Rather than bring back the first world, she wants to accept the past and go on in the future, deleting everything and redoing doing it all on a clean slate. And this is an equally bad outcome because in both cases, we still die! So now our hopes lie in us, in healing Bartleby to get his guidance. And in the final fight of the world, Spider challenges us to a battle in the Sandstorm. Respectfully, kinda lame fight, this area looks gross, the pumpkin-headed wizard companion had a glitch, the quest completion didn't register, and because of that, they had to be left behind on this adventure. I genuinely could not get into it all the way. Being trapped in the brown dimension, it looks like the inside of a vacuum cleaner. But we did it! After another triumphant battle, we have beaten Spider, of all people. But we can't put him down though, because if he perishes, then Grandma Raven has no opposition and we will still lose. Now, Malari, who has decided to join us on this wacky adventure on account of recently being diagnosed with a bad case of FOMO-itis, thinks it's not a good idea to keep Spider alive. So she tries throwing some green at Grandfather Spider and he catches it, snatches up Malari, and then skedaddles off, leaving her in the hands of the Cabal, with Grandfather Spider joining them, just as we were about to grab the eyeball and be on equal playing field. And we leave and still do that, Bartleby's at least mentally returning to his normal state, and holy shit, there is just a lot that I gotta explain right now. Okay, um, okay, how do I put this? Oh, okay. Well, Malari is the ultimate nepotism baby of the spiral. And I mean it. One thing that Grandma Raven has not been in Arc 3 is a lovely person. Instead, she is pretty hellbent on destroying everything when that wasn't the case in earlier interactions. And why, and why is that? Well, it turns out Malari is the daughter of Raven. In fact, in Latin, Malari translates to Little Raven. And not only that, Malari was created out of all of the empathy and good that Raven had at the time. Meaning that Malari's personality defaults to being a whimsical little hobbit friend who's loyal and will listen to anything other people say. Whereas Raven transformed herself into a ruthless god, so she would mentally be powerful enough to do the deed and to end her old career creations and her children and everything she has concocted in the past and I guess across this time she like lost any additional value it like slowly left her body so now she's a ruthless monster with a child who can very easily be manipulated like clay she looks like clay she has a clay face but both of them emotionally can be changed from that point like if grandma raven develops some sort of empathy she can maybe return back to normal and just to be safe raven hides malari in polaris the furthest edge of the spiral so she can return retrieve her child and then maybe Baba Yaga when the world fully resets. What this means is that Spider acquiring 
Malari is a massive blow to Raven's side in this fight, as Malari was gonna do the default, and now Spider can manipulate Malari's magic to benefit his side. So I head over to the Arcanum and share the news. All the characters are in disbelief, especially Baba Yaga, on account of her adopted daughter being held hostage by Wizard Mass Genocider number three. And I own, she she reassures, she she she's like, ah damn, that freaking bites. What a bummer. You wanna go on a spaceship? Imperia is, in my opinion, the best world of the game. Not Azteca, or Wizard City, or Zafaria, or anything that's spoiler material after this. In my opinion, this is the best it gets. Fights made me genuinely excited. It was the coolest looking. Nothing overstayed its welcome. It's fairly digestible for this game's standards, and it actually rewards players for committing to the story. This is the Marine Ford of Wizard 101, and I mean that in the best way possible. Right away, this is James T. Pork, a Star Trek pig who is easily the best character in the game. I love this dude. He's a funny little guy who's actually useful. Something that you would be surprised is a rarity. This alone already drops into like the top 3% of the characters in the spiral. As a reminder for what's going on, Spider wants to bring back the past, Raven wants to bring forward the future, but both want the present gone. We can't have that. Imperia takes place in the exact center of the spiral. Both Spider and Raven are going to Spider's heart. If Spider gets the heart back, he wins and we die. If he fails to get his heart back, Raven wins and we die. Mind you, these are the gods of this story, and neither one of them want us alive. And the third god, Bartleby the Magical Talking Tree, is dying, and if we don't help him, we have no chance of victory. Unfortunately, the only hope we have now is Malari. So the only way we can survive and the Spiral can survive is if we manage to get Malari back, recruit her, and then find a way to defeat both gods at the same time, because if if one goes down, the other will win. So in summary, we're, we're, we're screwed. But if the Arcanum doesn't at least attempt to save everyone, then what's the point? So they made this giant ship called the Spiral Arc, and the goal is to sail slash fly into Imperia and go get her done. We're gonna be joined by Ion's brother, Spark with a C. We also gotta find a captain of this massive thing, because the Sky Ocean to get to Imperia is incredibly dangerous. It's a Space Bermuda Triangle. My first option was finding Taylor Cooleridge back from Chrysalis, because he apparently survived the voyage there. And turns out this is an fully true. It seems that during his sailing days, he was looking for El Dorado, j just roll with it. And while he was in his sleep, his navigator, who was Pork, was actually the one to do it. So I stumble onto Azteca and find them. And mind you, after in-game years since this has happened, Azteca still has a meteor shower problem. So then Pork joins, along with him, he has a doctor pig named Beans, who is also here. And before we leave, it's revealed that Pork went to Imperia the first time, and his decisions there will impact us for later. For one, during his visit to Imperia, he was asked and eventually did bring Ione and Spark with a C from Imperia to the Arcanum. Now we're starting the expedition. Unfortunately, within two minutes, we fail and crash land, only to meet what actually makes Imperia different. See, the spiral acts like a whirlpool, maybe like a spiral. Wow! A majority of the worlds move consistently, and the closer to the heart they are, typically the smaller they get. Because of this, Imperia's got worlds so tiny that we just have a bunch of micro worlds and micro stories within a greater story, which is what this game has done before, but it's not annoying. And the variety here is like just enough to where it's fine. First off, we land in Ariel. This acts as a giant ship graveyard for anyone sailing near the heart and crashes for any reason. It's full of castaways like this guy named Khan, and he's mad because Pork abandoned him on the first voyage, taking away his nose in the process. But it's okay, after I convince him that having a nose is just a fad, everyone is friends again. Khan's gonna help out. We have a new strat for transport. Like the spiral arc is a lost cause, we aren't gonna fix it. So instead, we're gonna use a escape pods in it to launch to other areas in Imperia and then build teleporters between them so we have better ways to get around. The first pod goes to Khan's home of Xanadu, and this place is under attack from Spider and his third son, the Bat. Unlike Spider's other failures like Scorpion and the Rat, the Bat is just a bunch of references and also a good guy. He thinks the Cabal is cringe. In this case, all of the Cabal members are parodies of Batman villains like when we fight Bane. I'm not even kidding, it's all downhill from here. Also, uh, Malari's here. Found, we found her. 
At first I was thinking, oh cool, we did the thing we have to do. But actually, no, this floating brain guy named Medulla shows up and takes Malori because Spider had no faith in his son. Otherwise, I'm gonna be real, in this section I turned off my brain. This entire area is, it, it, it's good, I just have nothing to add to it. Generally, the rule of thumb is if a character has annoying looking ears, its area is just gonna be okay. There's more filler characters in this story than I have blood cells. The next escape pod goes to Athenor. Our landing causes an avalanche so bad, and at the the same time, the core of the micro world is being tampered with. Bat did it off screen, by the way. He was trying to slow his dad down. It, w it was for a good reason. This place sucks to live in. You either live in the magma caverns or the unforgiving cold. So dwarves live both on the inside and outside and produce their own temperatures and then give them to the other group so nobody burns or freezes to death. And then Medulla shows up again. He talks about how he's a brain, braining away with Malori. All the dwarves are saved. All of them are happy, hulking little dwarves, uh, high hoeing their hose and whatever. I don't the next micro world is too important to skip, but I'm gonna provide a warning. This area is like disgusting, like I'm, I'm, I'm being entirely serious. The bat knows where Medulla's hiding out at, that being the inside of a sky squid, because this is a sky ocean, there, there's uh, there's like sky sea life. I hate this place, a lot of squishes and jiggles, I, I hate it. I got nausea from Wizard 101. We disguise the next pod as a fish, the squid eats it, we meet this guy named Dint, he's not good, then he drowns. Uh, Last stop in this gross, sticky realm of sadness and self-loathing is the central axum. This is a part of the brain we managed to stumble into the squid's brain for a fight. Before facing Medulla, there's a rotten little weasel named the Quizzler. Oh, I get it. It's a reference. That means it's funny. No, I get to do it. Medulla. This brain in a brain, he's being a prick. He even hypnotized all my friends. The brain Dundu does get defeated, and Malari is even rescued. Too bad she's dying now also. Because of all of the trauma her mind and body went through when being experimented on, mind controlled, having magic saps from her, her spirit is being dragged away. And if that happens, we got a stinky little corpse on our hands. That's no good. So the Arcanum Wizards, you know, justifiably, they're freaking out. Baba Yaga, despite her child eating ways. Hopes it all ends well. If not, she's got a free meal. It's a win-win. The life wizard Xander, along with Beans the pig, both do what they can to stabilize her. And essentially what's happening is Malari's spirit is being dragged away by Raven of all people. Malari will die if her spirit refuses to return and Raven will win. And oh my god, an actual cutscene place. You heard me. An actual animated cutscene of these characters interacting with the vocals synced up to the animations. It took a hundred in 60 hours, but we have functioning lips. This is the only time this has happened. In this cutscene, Raven and Malori agree to work together on account of Malari being a part of Raven. It seems that Raven might have just one, and we are done. But not quite. Xander proposes seeking a neutron star and making the child eat it. And for the first time since my arrival to the spiral, Moral leaves Wizard City and in the flesh, he goes, HELL NO! YOU ARE DOING SHIT TO THAT KID! Oh, by the way, Finnegan Jackalboots, Bartleby wants to see you. He's about to die. He has like an hour to live. And so, an important test comes. From day one, Bartleby knew I was the chosen wizard who would save the spiral several times over. Before he lost his eye, he knew I would grow to the hero of the spiral. As he nears death and the future becomes fuzzy, he allows us to take a test, a test to determine if Finnegan Jackalboots will be the one and only disciple of Bartleby along with his powers to see if I can be his scion. And if not, the, all of the waters of the spiral will be undrinkable because his death will destroy all the trees and all the life. Definitely bad. I do that. Bartleby Bongus survives and now we are officially on an equal field to his spider and raven. The next steps are to make sure the bat stays loyal and to properly revive Malari. If we do that, then we will have the scion of raven and the scion of spider, and we will have more than enough power to stop the destruction once and for all. So Merle wishes me luck, the council of light says thank you, the cow professor who's been watching over Bartleby pretends to be plot relevant, and now it's time to enter the astral plane. What's basically a dream realm where all the perceptions of everything from every person in existence storage. The only way to revive Malari is 
is to enter her dreams and drag her spirit out ourselves. And the only way we would be able to enter is with a Scion Hall Pass, which we now have. Mosey back on over to Imperia, take a quick detour at this jungle ring where there was like an alien species. I don't care and neither should you. I won't lie, I was disappointed when I saw this on the map and then it ended up being this. In short, this is the place we can revive Malari at and her brain is a wreck. Her perception of Ravenwood is overwhelming. It made her feel small. And you know what? I get it. Malari, high school can be stressful, especially when your teacher is a literal cow, and Merle looks like a- how did you mess this up? That's not even the right primary color. Can you even be that colorblind? I love this area a lot. It makes a lot of sense in context while also celebrating everything up to this point. And we fight the evil Merle in a pop quiz battle, then we chase Malari as Spider is also here trying to convert her. Complete failure by by the way, not at all successful getting Malari on his side. Then Spider offers to let us live if we join. A decent offer until you realize the outcome would mean that Duncan, Grimwater, and the Quizzler are also going to be there with me. Yuck. No thank you. We then find ourselves in Finnegan's mind mid-chase. It's all of the earlier worlds. It's almost like an inception in- <laughs> Damn it! It's Bellic! Dream Bellic is here, back again with his stupid curses of raw, 300k health, break his legs, suddenly Dream Malastare appears, and for the final time, actually for real this time, I promise, he says, good job, I'm not real, you have to let me go, my death was only kind of your fault. At the end, we corner Malari in a fake Polaris, witnessing Baba Yaga choosing to sacrifice her baby-eating ways to become a loving mother. And then Malari has the realization that if we don't save the spiral, then Baba Yaga is gonna cease to exist, and she doesn't like that. So for once and for all, Malari is ready to help out. Next up, we gotta retrieve Bat. He's in the home that Spark and Ione were born in, Nembari. This is an extremely advanced society that knew Spider would return and prepped for it. So Bat gets captured and now we need to find ways to twist this back to normal. And one thing we can do is go to the nearby aeroplanes that's like this lovely plane area, the calm before the storm, and look at it because it is the city that powers the Nembari people. It's, it's peace. It's inner peace. However, um, at one point, Pork is captured, and we quite literally have to face his fears. Then the dwarves force me to play some game called Whirly Burly. This feels like a board game. It's alright. Eventually, I do find Spark and Ion's long-lost mother, and she gets very upset at Pork for letting Spark come back home with them. And it turns out their father was unalived by the current leader, who's kind of an uncool dude, if I'm being honest. So uncool that I forgot his name writing this on the script, so it probably doesn't matter. Just chuck him in the dungeon. Oh yeah, also that ring jungle with the corn people. Yeah, that's uh, falling apart. Spider and Raven take turns begging us to convert to their respective religions. We all say no because Bartleby is nice and also he's a tree. That's the team for us three. And now the non-tree gods are pretty upset about all of us not joining them. Taking us to the center of the center of the spiral, the actual place where Spider's heart remains and where Bartleby once rested before the first world broke apart the husk. Here, all of the secret weapons are hanging out. Rat and Scorpion make quick appearances, going into a hideout that will only open after the spiral is destroyed. Assuming they gave me enough time for Spider to grab his heart, Raven summons the final of the big three titans, the Storm Titan, and uses it to stall and help her win this fight. And Bartleby gives us some trees, I guess, uh, they, uh, that calms down the Storm Titan for a little bit. With this time of weakness, I, along with my fellow Scions, along with another other wizard who was just happy to be here. Thank you again. It's time for a fight with the Storm Titan. This is Triton. Sure. This is where my game crashed and the servers were going down in 20 minutes, so from this point, I wasn't I wasn't all too jazzed. I had to rush this a little bit. I'm actually kind of upset about that. By hitting the trident, the Storm Titan runs out of power, and that allows us to make it to Spider's Heart, where Raven and Spider are starting their final showdown at Spider's Heart. And I don't necessarily think that's gonna fit inside of him. One physically weakened, the other mentally weakened. A fight is about to begin, but Bartleby, the magical tree, appears in spirit and asks the gods to not not do the whole destroy everything bit. And in response, both characters tell him to jump off a big, 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 
big tree accessible bridge. Suddenly, the Storm Titan's back, and all the Scions are going super. Malari and the Bat give all the power they can, and it transforms me into a giant wizard to take on the Storm Titan. We use numerous, magnificent, powerful spells against this Titan. All schools, all of extreme beauty and magnificence, and it's wonderful, and oh my god, the server shut down in 10 minutes. Uh, the, 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 the Storm Titan is defeated. Rat and Scorpion are out of the picture because they ran away, and now they're like in the void somewhere, and Team Bartleby has successfully won the war, knowing there is no chance of reviving the first world and accepting the spiral despite its flaws, Grandfather Spider and Grandmother Raven find peace and acceptance despite their ongoing affairs. They accept the past what it is, look into the future for what it can be, and decide to take it on together. Malari reunites with Baba Yaga. The bat decides to help the spiral where he can, and we can rest knowing that nothing can stop us. And that's arc three, my favorite of it all. It had its flaws like all good things do. The narrative felt rewarding for investing all of that time into it. If it ended here, I would be okay with that. So you could probably guess I was surprised to remember, oh wait, we got another arc. Well, if we got anything like arc three, then I'm sure we got nothing to worry about and nothing to fear. This tree freaks me out. Arc 4 is weird. Now, unlike previous arcs that used established characters to explain and advance the story, and even just add more depth to pre-existing characters, most of Arc 4 is really secluded and absolutely takes a unique approach compared to the ones that came before it. When I was starting out, I had a vague idea of what to expect in each of these major arcs, but here I didn't know when things were gonna happen and what was gonna happen until they happened. And to avoid spoilers, I kept it that way. So when I got here, especially after seeing how this game's evolved and all this stuff that was truly a joy for me at points. I was wondering how this game was gonna go. Like, how was I gonna feel about Arc 4? Well, Caramel is the worst world in the game. Throughout Arc 3, wizards are loyal to Grandfather Spider through the Cabal, and they did what they could do to bring back the First World. It's shown that Spider is not only done with that, but is likely going to prevent anyone from attempting to bring back First World. So I would not recommend bringing one of the most dangerous known living entities out of retirement just to stop you. So the Cabalists are in a bit of a wreck, and all around things are going terribly. Remaining Cabalists have formed factions and are now fighting between each other. And since we've defeated every Cabalist that we've met, and even though there's already plenty of Cabalists to reuse. All of them are new characters. Like, really? Not even a single person could have been brought back through as a Cabalist? Not only that, you could have just brought back old characters and had, like, reveals that they were secretly in the Cabal. Maybe, like, an elf from Avalon or that dick-ass zebra snake toast from Zafaria. But no! Here's another wacky cast of characters. Have fun learning them all! But before we actually arrive in the New World, a couple of things are gonna happen. Ione provokes me to Arcanum Liaison as an official member, which is neat, I guess. I'd assume that means I'm on payroll, so no complaints there. A member of the Arcanum named Malware Von Trapp has been working as a mole in the Cabal for us. To prove his loyalty, he reveals that the Cabal were gonna start by assassinating the King of Chrysalis. So cool, he's a friend for about five minutes, because in the very next room, he's revealed to be a double spy for a man by the name of the Old One. Not the Old Cobb, the Old One. They are different people. Please do not mix up Old Cobb and Old One. I don't know why the game decided to name two very important characters the same thing. Now the old one, the, this green octopus guy, he's hosting a grand summit where all the Kabbalist factions are gonna meet up together along with make peace with the Arcano. This summit is held in Caramel, the world released in mid-2020 and oh, I don't like this one. When it comes to Wizard 101, you can differentiate each world and their quality through three things, the presentation, the gameplay, and of course, for me specifically, the story. There's a lot of waiting periods before we get to story droplets. So the first two need to be good. Make the enemies cool. Make me fall in love with the world. Do stuff that's creative and unique and actually make this 
feel like a quest. This is what any adventure story will do. When you go to a new place, you want to make it something neat, and you want the viewer or the player character to fall in love with the area and know the pains or the beauties behind it. Now, my favorite worlds so far excel in at least one or two of these things. They might be lacking in some aspects, but in the end, they excite me in seeing where the story's going to continue or what places I'm going to go to. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, my least favorite worlds are weak, but at least have some sort of takeaway I can appreciate fondly. I wasn't a big fan of Krakatopia. It felt repetitive in gameplay and in areas, but it made up in context given that it was the first world past the tutorial world and it was still unraveling the greater story. Marley Bone had some odd moments and mostly took place on rooftops, but there were points where I enjoyed traveling through it, like in the prison. And Celestia had a ton of ugly rooms, a lot of unappealing areas, and most of them just existed because I could go underwater now. But it had a pretty good backstory. Caramel is just the worst for me. Now in concept, Caramel is a cool idea. It's mostly based on Switzerland, and it's the Candy World, a theme that's been in plenty of other games and shows, so it's not like this impossible thing to execute. And Caramel is most likely meant to parody and criticize the real-world Switzerland company, Nestle. The company mascot is Nana, and this is all canon. All of Caramel is facing labor problems. The working classes are stuck in warehouses, poor conditions, bad water supply, and Nana's on Twitter.com blissfully making fun of the Aztecian tragedy. Okay, never mind, this world's actually kind of funny. <laughs> At this summit, the Old Ones, one hell of a respected dude, Old Ones managed to recruit some of the most threatening Kabbalists all in one place with the goal of reunifying everyone back to the initial Arcanum with the goal of prepping for the future to bring back everyone. All is going well until it isn't because a giant hole takes Old One away. So now the Kabbalists are freaking out, running around Caramel, destroying whatever they can, and to make matters worse, some rotten witches are making the gummy bears sour. So they're doing company damage. Guess who's gotta stop that? The hole that snatched the old one is known as a cavity, and they've been popping out a ton recently, so the goal is to find each Cabal member, check and see if they were the ones responsible. Spoilers, none of them are, because they all liked old one conveniently for all of their different reasons, just before they all fall into their own cavities. As we maneuver around Caramel and stop the Cabalists causing mayhem across the world, I also have to investigate what's wrong with Nana's company. And this is where the Cabal members are part responsible, just like how they're responsible for some of the worst moments of my life. I hate this kangaroo. I wish I could smash this kangaroo with a giant mallet. This fight took too long. He's ugly. The characters I met here were ugly. Everything here is ugly. I wish I wasn't here. I felt like I wanted to throw up 16 times. Losing fights to this made me lose so much frustration. This was the only world where I actually fell asleep playing. I have never done that in a game. Now, as it turns out, Nana's candy company is very corrupt. Shocking. I know. Moles work 14 hours in this chocolate mine, six days a week. They're exposed to the green sauce. Only higher position jobs like Nana ambassadors are even like remotely good. Just objectively speaking, Nana's company is horrendous. And as it turns out, the witches who are supposedly doing all this harm, they're, they're pretty good people, <laughs> which is just an acronym that stands for workers interested in tackling corporate hegemony. And Nana doesn't respect the guilds or unions, so she's instructing her top employees with creating all the sour gum bears to make them look deliberately bad by self-sabotaging her company to assure success. This is propaganda and also Hamster Willy Wonka's in on it. Every corner is more disgusting than the last. These green freaks called gobblers are being used for candy sweat. I don't want to be in caramel no more. Ultimately, Nana's caramel delights is too far gone for minor fixes. We just gotta overthrow the whole company, liberate the workers, stop the person responsible for sourcing all the gummy bears, and we end off at the Grand Nana's main building where she's on a lunch break and her former employees confront her till all of a sudden a cavity takes her. This time we gotta jump through and rescue Grand Nana. I actually like the Nanas. This is worth it. Nana specifically managed to find her way into the void and just as she gets retrieved, it shows up a dark, shadowy, sick, and twisted version of me at the end of Arc 3. It doesn't do much, only sent some strange beings to attack, and once defeated, it takes its leave. And we, and we take our leave, arresting Nana for her crimes against humanity, rescuing every person who's gone missing, all except for the old one who nobody could find. And this is not good. I barely make it back to the Arcanum from that hellscape, completely ignore Ione because I, I don't have an emotional attachment to her, and head back to Bartleby and Ravenwood with 
with his eye of the future, he sees a beast making waves and crashing the currents of time, growing in power, hoping to force the waves of the sea and destroy everything. The only thing that can stop it is me, and failure to stop this problem will lead to nothing happening. And it will doom everything. Lemuria is where things start picking up for Arc 4. So the cavities are essentially portals into the nothings domain, and staying there for too long assimilates things into the nothing. This is what happened to the old one. He was stuck there long enough to where he became part of the nothing, losing his life and a majority of his existence, but in exchange, the nothing gains the composure and patience he once had. And for a majority of Lemuria, we're the only person who gets to see or interact with him, in part from our exposure to the void and the nothing. Now, the nothing has technically become the old one. He has the knowledge of a genius, but the wisdom of a toddler, meaning that if he's exposed to too much bad shit, he's gonna perhaps become the greatest threat of the spiral. To make matters worse, old one was virtually a sociopath. He conducted experiments and did horrible things exclusively just to see what would happen. Old one was initially an arcanum wizard, studying and modifying the life around him, but he slowly adopted the Kabbalist beliefs, choosing to see if he could reassemble the spiral and bring back the first world through science. He was, in fact, very corrupt. Like, the reason why he wanted to unify the Cabal with the Arcanum all the way back in Caramel was just to get back to his Arcanum lab. And personally, I think it's just nice to see a character have so many layers added to their morality. This is easily one of the most interesting characters this game has done. Now, one day back in the Arcanum, the Old One discovered that the Spiral was gonna prioritize larger worlds and let the little ones die based on just energy priority. And that's a bad thing. So we got this guy named Stallion Quarter to discover all of the tiny ones, get the locations down, give them to Old One, and then he produced a world synthesizer that would allow him to connect all of these small worlds into one larger one and prevent their destruction. The trade-off is that after he did this, he shrunk Lemuria and made it run on a machine in the Arcanum. The issue with this, though, is unfortunately it's about to run out of mana and everyone in Lemuria is going to perish. So before entering it, we have to grow the planet and release it back into the spiral, otherwise all the life and research the Old one kept there is going to be lost forever. Now back then, Stallion found out about this and he was outraged. The old one used Stallion to create heroes that would fall under his beliefs and help him build the first world. I don't know. I don't even, I don't even freaking know. The just, just, the old one's kind of a dick. But he clones Stallion without his permission. He gets upset. They have a fight. Stallion instantly loses, forgetting he's fighting an emotionless monster with an IQ in the quadruple digits, and ends up getting frozen by the old one as they're right about to fight, leaving him frozen for years at this point. So first we actually got to verify the existence of Lemuria and all of this. The nothing joins me on my quest and begins to follow me around. I go from places to Mirage and to the Marleybone Museum. By the way, Ghost Dog from Chrysalis, uh, he, he's alive, didn't know that. Uh, but yes, Lemuria does exist. They worship the old one as some sort of god, mainly because... I mean, he created he he's, he created all their stuff. I, I I get it. At one point, after talking in Polaris, we stumble upon the lab where Stallion was frozen, and we save him. He's pretty happy about being in the future, actually. Sure, his family's all gone, but you know, new adventures away. You can't be too upset about that. The two and a half of us enter the old one's Arcanum lab, where Lemuria is on life support. The hesitant Arcanum wizards allow us to reinvestigate the research and grow back Lemuria. And it's in and it's an interesting world. So Lemuria is a lot like Imperia, being a collection of micro worlds with very minimal cross interaction. The difference here is that unlike Imperia, and I didn't like this one that much, Imperia has some clear goals. Every movement, every plan was calculated. There was a larger team and we had an objective and everything felt like we had to do it. But in Lemuria, I feel like I'm being dragged wherever the nothing thinks he's supposed to be going. And this felt very video gamey. Like, like I know, I, I know, crazy, I know. And, and repetition has been an issue in a lot of these worlds. I mean, with a game plan where you just go to each lab, you, you'll see quickly. First up, we got the Lemurians themselves, the Old One's favorite citizen. They're freaking the hell out because of the sky changing, all this new stuff around them. We think it's Thursday, they think it's the rapture. And the goal of Lemuria is to enter a building where part of the world synthesizer is located at. Then we can decide what to do from there. However, each lab on Lemuria has an entombment stone, and by obtaining all six, then we can actually enter the lab holding the synthesizer. And, and while all this is happening, Stallion is gonna start looking for 
for each and every cloned hero of him that the old one created and join forces with me and create like a giant Avengers team. Guys, I'm gonna be honest, none of this part of the quest holds that much of an impact in gameplay manner. It's literally come in, meet one or two members of the Quartermain gang, help them with their problems, fight the enemy responsible for their problems, go to the lab with them, have them realize the old one was a bad dude so they don't believe the old dude was a good friend, get whatever attunement stone was there, repeat. There's the lemurs, of course, then we got this lovely surfs up hidden beach town, Conan the Barbarian Desert World, a corrupt platypus suburb, a noir detective town, and then just Salem Witch Trials for some reason. And then at the end of each section, Stallion recruits people and gets his league of exemplary personages. And we get the chance to meet and fight alongside each of these characters. All eight of them! There's Stallion, of course, he's the main one. Then we got Bantam, Solomon Crane, Buck Gordon, Duck Savage, Mandar, The Shadow, and Dog Tracy. I'm sure you get the gimmick. None of these people will ever have unique moments to shine. I'm just gonna refer to them as the Quartermains because that's what they are. They're just a bunch of Quartermains. But the shining aspect of this world is the old one, the nothing. It's starting to absorb the world around him, questioning everything we see, wondering why some people act the ways they do, justifying things by his own logic, and most of all seeing how terrible the old one was during his time roaming in the spiral. At one point, nothing decides to change its name to design. He thinks the word design sounds cool and likes the idea of having a personality. So after claiming the masses, solving crime, leading a platypus resistance, regaining the strength of Mandar, and preventing Salem's witch trial pain, all of the attunement stones and all the quarter mains are brought together. The nine and a half of us head over to the old one's lab, cut through his defenses, all his design phases in and out of all the non-Chupo folk being able to see him, and then we stumble upon the old one's final, final defense for real this time. A clone of him. So you know how I'm like the scion of Bartleby now? Well, old one, uh, yeah, he, he made one of those himself. It, it, just him. He, he did that like a few generations ago. Uh, helped carry out the mission in case anything happened to old one. Uh, he fails, by the way. So the Quartermains take the completed world synthesizer and realize, oh, wait. Damn, we can just like rebuild all of the first world with no casualties, no challenges. We can literally make a utopia and just end the spiral and and like do the best of both worlds. Like no one would be upset. There would there we wouldn't fall in space anymore. The quarter mains do not take my response very well. So somehow Finnegan clutches up a 1v8 fight, embarrassing the quarter mains forever and ever. And design realizes instead of perfecting, it makes more sense to help the people, as then everyone can have have purpose, and the synthesizer reactivates on accident. So he jumps in on it, saving everyone in exchange for his current living plane, presumably removing him from the tail. And back at the Arcanum, I give the synthesizer to Malwerf, and he smashes it with a sledgehammer. Then we go back to that freaky, bug-eyed tree, and she reveals that nothing is becoming something. Also, there's like freaky stuff happening in space. Dude, Novus is insane. Like, based on how this game is designed, I think that really only older folks are gonna make it to these later arcs. That's why early on the conflict wasn't nearly as complex, because children would never make it to Morganth simply based on the difficulty spikes in those worlds. As such, Arc 3, but especially Arc 4, get a bit more mature. It should be clear by this point, but there is not a main villain of Arc 4 who is alive. The old one is obviously a catalyst for these problems, using others in his benefits in hopes of manipulating the spiral through technology over magic, by the nothing reawakening after the end of arc 3 and then consuming the old one during caramel, the nothing has become mostly sentient and has learned that his food was a terrible person. So then when the nothing becomes humanized as design and jumped on the world synthesizer, what actually happened is that the nothing, a cosmic entity of unknown power, actually synthesized himself and gained access to planetary power. Powers. As such, a completely new world is formed by the name of Novus, and nobody is there to claim it. When checking out this new place, I actually stumble upon my old friend, my dear deceased Wolfmount, all the way back from Winter Tusk, the very same who burned its head off in a furnace after that tragic incident. This was emotional and a bit awkward for me, I've been seeing some other mounts. I thought the wolf was gone, nope, hanging out in space. Cool. We had a fight. 
took two hours. Design has also attained the ability to hear the thoughts and dreams of everyone in the spiral from his synthesizing. And as such, Design decides to dedicate himself to fulfilling those desires. Now, I'm not making this next part up. It's either real or a wild coincidence, but Novus is partly based on Europe's expansion and scramble for Africa in the 1880s, when most of Europe's empires made their way to the territory to expand. So all the equivalents make their way here. We got Marley Bone, ew, and Polaris joining, you know, Britain and France. We've already had enough time with these two. But then we got Monquista, again, Pirate 101 location. I'm ignoring it, but we've met them before. And Valencia. This is where all the horses come from. It's meant to be Italy. The only horse we really know and care about up to this point was Diego the Duel Master because he was in the Council of Light. They could have gone with Caramel, but honestly, I'm so glad they didn't. And they did this so they could make jokes about Mario characters. All of the horses are Mario characters. You got Mario, Luigi, Peach, Daisy, all political and horses. Design's doing a good thing. He he made a utopia that benefits everyone. Plenty of land for everyone to enjoy and share. That means nothing bad will happen. It's a scramble for Africa with a bunch of fictional politicians. What do you think happened? Everyone hates each other. Everyone wants to expand and negotiations are scarce. As such, this will lead to military conflicts. Coincidentally, all the respective world leaders not being here adds to the problems. We knew about the Queen of Marleybone. Uh, the Polaris penguin that we met named Red Rosa is too busy helping out clean up the internal affairs. The Peach Horse just couldn't make it for a good chunk of the story and... Yeah, I don't know. I haven't met him yet. All of them aren't here. All their representatives sure are politicians. So even though every party would be guaranteed to get their hopes and dreams and necessities through Novus, they all got a little too greedy and doom any chances of retribution. So this means that design is mentally being confused and shaken up, making Novus even more exploitable. And all while this is happening, we still have the Kabbalists going around, Copy Cat and Quake Charmer, specifically from Caramel, are causing chaos because they don't trust Novus. They want everyone gone to prevent any risk to anyone. One. And while all of this is happening, we have another Kabbalist named the Manticore secretly working behind the scenes and trying to use design for his own benefit. So I'm sure you can see where everything falls apart throughout this. I have to juggle political negotiations, calming down design, calm the Cabal, and hunt down the Manticore who goes hiding for a majority of this world. Because if the Manticore spends too much time with design, he's going to use his powers to rebuild First World because... That's what they want! Nothing will change if everyone goes back to the first world. It makes no difference. You gain nothing. You get nothing working with the nothing. And guys, I knew this was coming from the very beginning or where, where there, there was going to be a part where I fall apart. A moment where I catch up to the level capacities. I go from being underleveled and carried to being a normal functioning wizard on track to play the game where I wouldn't have to grind. Where I reach the max level and I can't abuse the system. But for one reason or another, Novus was starting to make me deteriorate. So I'm glad this was near the end. Novus severely bothered me for what it amounted to. A petty, repeated story with the Marley Bones being a crucial focus. Every single time Marley Bone has been a focus in any capacity, it is a below average Wizard 101 world for me. And that streak has continued. At this point, I just genuinely was starting to miss the old game. Like, when I look at the older worlds, there's so much color and whimsy to everything, and, and now it's gone from a lovely PS2 game to a gritty Wii one. Like, you can't even make Caramel look like a fun candy world, and I don't like how desaturated and complex some of these things have gotten. And sure, I can see individual grass blades now, but at what cost? I will say, simply returning to older worlds with new areas is something I appreciate here. Like at the start, there's a very solid chunk spent at Mushu, but in the end, it's mostly watching idiots of a bunch of different worlds bicker until Design gets tired of it, and these little freaks don't deserve it. So he turns the car around right as they're about to go to the Six Flags. Novus is cancelled. All of it gets shut down, and who do the politicians blame for this? That's right. Me! Who? I am now wanted by four military states. I go over to design, and the Manticore is revealed to be the assistant for the Polaris reps, who, by the way, uh, out of each country, I would say at least Polaris owes me, assuming I only do main quests. If I did dungeons, Marleybone's queen would have owed me her life. So, at, at, at most, there should only be two states after me. My time's been wasted. This has been an objective net loss. Not even the Super Mario horses could cheer me up. Then comes the Manticore fight, and this bullshit took me 60 minutes on my first attempt. It involves shape-shifting, waiting for 19 years for everything to go. Everything repeats. Well, I gotta look at this thing. And, and, and yeah, you know, I get why Design's upset about everything. The nothing wants to be nothing again. He wants to be nothing and then forget about all this because of circumstance and eating a genuinely horrible, terrible person. The nothing is upset. And as such, the nothing rejects everything, deciding to tear down Novus, destroying the benefits Design has provided and goes rogue. 
And just as each of the world reps step in to arrest me, Clyburn, the Arcanum rep of Celestia, brings me back to base. Then Xander reveals that Design is reverting to the nothing, but is stuck to the spiral because of Novus. And that's not being taken well by him. Now the freaky Arcanum tree, named Sybil, has access to the thoughts and dreams of every person in the spiral. I'm so sorry for you. I understand why your eyes look like that now. To end this arc, I gotta calm down Design and free my name from the spiral militaries trying to hunt me down. As such, I'll have to enter the dream realms and comfort design within them, as that is where he is fled off to. Ione is also able to give me a warrant, so now the spiral enemies after me cannot arrest me, but kill me? Uh, that, yeah, that's fair game, actually. My friends, it is time to end this. I was... Pleasantly surprised by Wallaroo. Now, compared to other finale worlds, it doesn't feel like a finale location. Like, we got the ruined homeland of the main villain, a decayed land that took centuries to be taken over, the heart of the spiral that celebrates a ton of cultures found within it, in Australia. But I can't lie, this felt like classic Wizard 101. For the first time since Imperia, I felt like there was some adventure here. I straight up love that this was an easy country equivalent, something that I'd argue hasn't happened since Mirage. Now, to justify why we're in Wallaroo, the country has a resource called the Dreaming. It's this pink liquidish substance that provides creativity and new ideas that can really help open up the mind. Many wizards take a voyage called the Walkabout, and this requires voyaging across Wallaroo until you attain inner peace and therefore wisdom. In this case, all our problems can be solved if we expose design with enough of this to bring them clarity. But in order to do that, I need to take the walkabout myself. So own lets me begin my totally tubular Australia adventure, and I was thinking, oh, which characters am I gonna have to meet now? No, Santiago appears. He comes back from Mirage, and he's gonna take this walkabout with us and help us find ourselves. Entering through the world door, I find myself in the big lovely city by the name of Hope Springs. And just like Australia, there's nothing of value in the outback. Just violence, sadness, overbearing judges, and the MacGuffin sauce. So I gotta go there anyway. First up, we actually gotta get to the outback. The Prime Minister isn't much help. I hope they have a horrible time at McDonald's. A man by the name of Crocodile Dandara, this is an actor, his real name is Paul, helps Santiago and I sneak out, uh, then he gets arrested. That's all the value they have here. Santiago and I found to find a few things in the real outback. A gang of dingoes led by Ned Colley. He's the most prominent one doing a Robin Hood, stealing from those who have too much. Along with Freddy Croker. This is a dream pun. I genuinely do not care. It's a B-tier wizard villain. Every world has a couple. And then we got the solo fights. I couldn't do it, man. Maybe I'm bad. Maybe I got carried. Maybe I had bad luck, but Wallaroo somehow broke me. Wallaroo took me 23 hours. I spent so, 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 so much time doing stupid shit on this world. Like, Wizard 101 was literally warping my reality to prevent me from progressing. On two separate sessions, I had my internet shut down and a power outage within a minute of logging on. During the walkabout, you have to take sleep breaks, and every time there is a solo fight where you have to confront design in the dream realm, in hopes of also preventing Freddy Croker from hopping into my dreams and doing that thing Freddy Krueger usually does to sleeping people. Uh, make them stop living. The problem comes from how difficult these solos can be. Solo fights can be either the easiest fights ever or the worst. I don't know why they exist, but if you don't come in with a very specific plan on these fights, like a very specific strat, looking them up, experimenting, have all the upgrades needed, have a decent amount of luck, if you don't have all of that combined, you will lose. And you can't grind for levels. I was max level for this, and it was still not enough. And I paid for the best gear. I did everything I was supposed to, and I still couldn't do it. Each of these fights are the physical manifestations of design's negativity. We literally have to beat the bad vibes to death. The very first fight, Rage, four hours. This took me four hours because I couldn't do it. When I beat the Hellspawn that launches nothing but lingering damage and phone calls for therapy sessions, I cried. This is not a bit. Wizard 101 is the only game that has made me sleep and the only one that has made me cry from joy from being done with a portion of it. Now, of course, this is Wizard 101. You already know that despite there being a clear goal, there's gonna be some stupid roadblocks in every waking moment that fairly overstays their welcomes. In this case, we got a corrupted police force. Just 
arresting everyone who's refusing to migrate to Hope Springs, I guess. Ned Kali thinks that's lame. His entire family is wanted by the police as a result. Honestly, I agree. At the same time, though, Judge Veg, that kangaroo back from Caramel, he's here. He's had a change of heart. He's found himself. He's cool now. We like him now. We do, we, we forgive him. There's a frog in a wheelchair as well. Uh, Luigi, the horse, is holding people hostage. That's not very kind-hearted. There's a koala named Morp, short for Morpheus, like the Matrix Man. Oh, um, and there's combat wombats. I like the combat wombats. That's cute. Guys, it literally amounts to nothing. And all of this is set up. Save hostages, stop the in-universe corruption with violent magic, enter the pink sauce, and curb stomp Freddy Krueger. It matters, but it also doesn't. Nothing matters. But I like it. It's just, it's, it's, it's classic world brought back in a new flavor. That flavor being Outback Steakhouse. Eventually, the whole gang, including the minimal useless side characters that I forgot the names of, found themselves in a large body of the Dreaming. Freddy Croker must be halted, and every character has to confront their previous demons. Santiago is interesting because he was the one who specifically brought the old one through the walkabout as well, therefore giving the old one the idea to create the Cabal, which technically causes every arc besides arc 2. As Malister took Bartleby's future eye to help the Cabal at the very start of this, he blames himself for all of these events, or I might be reading this wrong, I don't know, it's convoluted. San Diego knows this was a gargantuan goof, and at least confronting it and acknowledging it, it gives inner peace. He moves on. It's beautiful. But through all of this, we leave the dreaming, and we reach the end. We learn that the past has already been decided. The Cabal has no chance of bringing back First World. We, we already knew that, but now we, now we super know. We leave our thoughts behind, our bad thoughts, our bad badness. And soon after that, I was able to swiftly take down Freddy Croker, obliterating him from Wallaroo. And with this, we are able to reach the deepest crevices of the Dreaming, finding where design is at, and the Dreamer capable of holding all the possibilities of what could be and what could have been. This is where Bartleby's dream self resides, and where creativity itself flows, we are truly in the land down under. I hate you. Design Awakens Santiago lets them know that life doesn't necessarily have a purpose. They just do it. You gotta find purpose. Design accepts this truth, instead taking advantage of whatever the spiral provides. The nothing is nothing. Design is design. And with this new perspective, they decide to live the way they choose to, allowing Novus to remain in the spiral as well. And on the same end, I, a person who has gone through this journey doing nothing but helping smaller people with their own problems, finally realized that it was okay doing everything I did to get to this point. Helping others any way I can. That was my purpose. Help others in their time of need. Cheer them up. It's kind of a good moment of clarity. I won't lie. I liked it. But folks, we aren't done just yet. Because Novus still has those politicians that want me gone. They have decided the only way to equally split Novus is not to split it, but to destroy it. Luigi the horse creates the Doom Moon with magic and designs fragments of power in Novus. With this new info, we need all the help possible to stop this destruction. I run on over, grab the Quartermains back in Lemuria, and a battle between a dozen people and the four major armies ensue. We hijack the Doom Moon. All that's left is the army of ships coming our way. This is the final battle. The Doom Moon gives us a smaller ship of my own I jump into. The final fight for Wizard 101, a cheat battle that you can easily win by spamming self buffs. So, I flew into the fleet of the spiral powers knowing what was at risk, having the Doom Moon to myself, and as I was watching this massive saga and substantial part of my life take its leave, I thought about all of it, knowing it was finally going to be done. I remembered everything it took to get to this moment. That's it. 
Returning to Novus, the corrupt representatives are all fired by their leaders. Design invites the Arcanum and Cabalus to a proper Novus summit, in which he apologizes for the era of his ways and vows that the future can be much stronger with the Cabalus returning to the Arcanum as it was originally intended. In the Arcanum, Sybil knew I was going to be happy in the end. She assures us that even after all this time, I will go to new worlds, I will reunite with old friends, and I will fight any new villains that approach. Wizard 101, as of now. Now has concluded. And I will be there when more adventures arise. I went back to Ione to finally talk about the end of my journey, the finish line. Yeah, hey, I'm a stupid idiot, says Ione. Uh, I'm not an important character that uh, has no value. How's your adventure? Did you caramel about everything you went through? Because I know this you have some puns. A uh, Lemuria joke. You know I can't do that in front of you. I can't end this with puns. I've been wizarding for the past six months, and I've already graduated. I've worked my way up to a renowned hero. I am THE Finnegan Jackal Boots. I've seen some things I've never imagined. Wizard 101 is a story about child abduction, slavery, colonialization, processing grief, the inability to change fate, evaluating our failures both personally and as a population, war, genocide, corporate greed, and accepting the fact that at some point, the existence of everything that will exist and is to exist will come to a close, knowing that we may not have a purpose with our times alive unless we do something with them. But it is also a story of self-worth, of friendship, of recognition, and the adoption of these truths, of finding light in a void of darkness, of taking even the tiniest grain of hope and materializing it into something that can change so many lives. It was, all things considered, counting the flaws as well, a fascinating experience, as I truly could see the world of the spiral evolving with me. And I have changed as a person. Maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, but I am not the same person I started as, and and I am content. That's cool. Do you want a space office? And that's how I got my space office. A long story, but it was worth it. So, what did I think? What did I think about my time in the spiral? Not as Finnegan Jackal Boots, but as Chupo. What did I think about this MMO that has been around for so many years as someone who has no connection with the game outside of a few commercials, was completely blind throughout the entire run, no nostalgic value, no bias, no anything? How was it for me? Well, I feel like, to an extent, that's a complicated question. Did I enjoy it? Well, I wouldn't play 200 hours of this game if I didn't like it. Though am I wrong for, to some capacity, being a little bit disappointed? Partly in the game and partly in myself, I, I came into this wanting to be a true wizard. That's the goal, that's the dream, but I looked at everything this game has to offer and I realized it's impossible to get the full experience. I still needed more time here, even after all this time. Even just by doing the story, I miss so much that I can't cover it all. I didn't farm, or get a good quality pet, or fight in dungeons, or try any raids, or get into fishing, or gather material to craft cards, or go through the annual events, or the PvP, and I hardly decorated my house to a level I would have done it if I tried. But I did everything in Wizard 101's main story, and it still feels like there was so much more I missed out on. I became so focused on finishing the main game, I was rarely able to step back and be a wizard. I quested, but I hardly spent any time within the hub, absorbing the world around me. It was always on to the next thing. I graduated Ravenwood and I was only there a semester. I didn't smell the roses. I didn't take in the time to soak in all this content that could have lasted upwards of years for me. That's why people like this series, because of the amount of time poured into here. Being treated as an escape, making your own story. And unfortunately for me, there's hundreds of hours remaining of that wizard experience in order to take it all in. And I don't know if I want to do it. And the same same goes for the story. I'm sure little Tobias slurping on chocolate milk started shaking violently when I didn't mention Winston Churchill was an ice wizard or something. So did I waste my time then? Do I regret it then? Well, I wouldn't say that. This was me going through what is, in my opinion, the largest part of Wizard 101, and at minimum, documenting that. That way, regardless of what happens in the future, we have some sort of video preservation of the main campaign that still isn't too digestible, but it definitely was easier to swallow than the alternative. Yet, this isn't to say there wasn't stuff I liked. I love 
loved how a ton of these areas felt and looked to roam around. I, 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 I was on a journey. It really was satisfying seeing payoff and plot progression between the hours of gameplay when they actually decided to show it. I had some really memorable fights, some I'll develop PTSD from, and many of these characters were terrific. And some of them I wish we had more time with because there's so many chunks that left me yearning for something cooler and it just kept adding up. But there was one thing, one thing that I realized kept me going the community of people who I garnered who decided to stick with me. I would have bullied a lot of you in high school, I'm not even gonna lie. I'm not too much of an MMO guy. I'm sure you figured that out objectively. Not even for just MMOs, but virtually anything needs a community, an audience, a group of people who will watch and enjoy whatever a creator of a product will produce. And across my journey, I used my ever iconic YouTuber privileges to get a team of wizards to heed my call and join me on this adventure by my side. And by the end of this, I can't can't help but recognize the only reason I made it to this point was because of people like you who chose to invest their time for this project just to make it easier on me personally. And as a wise Canadian hockey player once said, it's not success unless you have someone to share it with. So with their permission, I need to credit a few folks who have helped me on this quest. So I want to thank all these individuals for their time helping me out. I especially need to thank a fan of the spiral by the name of Boblin Goblin. This madman not only hopped on the wizard train, but practically conducted it. Through researching, they created PDFs of every Wizard 101 world in text form, just so the specifics of each story are forever preserved in case anything happens in the future. If you are at all interested in hearing more about Wizard 101, check out his Tumblr. This was not at all possible without his contributions, and they were a very nice person who I am very grateful could have been a part of this. But most of all, Thank you to the XP bar, who was there until the very end, until I hit the max level. Rest in peace. And who can forget about the yellow arrow, guiding me down the right path all the time, leading me into the right direction. I will miss you most of all. Lastly, of course, thank you. The folks at home watching this right now for sticking with my freaking annoying voice for this long. I'd assume this means you can tolerate me, so subscribe, check out my other videos. If you want to see me anywhere else, you can find me on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok. There's a Discord and a Reddit community where there's more updates behind the scenes, silly haha, stuff like that. To the developers, the King's Isle folks who I know are watching this, I mean this with full sincerity. I may not love your game, but I for sure did not hate it. This has aged decently well. I'm glad it was Wizard 101 one that temporarily gave me mental health issues. I truly do enjoy the world of the spiral and the content within it. I'm sure you guys have a reason for still using a membership like this, but in that case, please make more of the game playable. I would argue at least the entire first arc should be free. I would hesitate, but I would be okay with a a even just Crocotopia and Marleybone permanently. Alternatively, do what Destiny 2 does and put up expansions. Do it for each arc. Regardless, the fact that Destiny 2 can be used as an example in this situation is in my opinion, embarrassing. I'd love to spend more time in the spiral. Please at least consider moving the paywall further down the game. Hey fellas, this is Chupo from Four Months in the Future. I got a lot of extra things I want to add here. I wanted to real quick give some updates and news regarding Wizard 101 and what you can do if you're at all interested. I felt like I was a bit too mean at the end of this, and having that post-Wizard clarity is kind of making me wish I said more things about specifically Arc 4 in a positive light, because it is still pretty decent. This isn't promoted or anything, but it's important I bring this up. Right now, the main game is redesigning Crocotopia. Pirate 101 is having some Crocotopia stuff as well. A lot of croc tent. There's a new world coming out. I think you pronounce it as Selenopolis. I'm gonna do a full compilation video in the future that may or may not include this as well, so please stay tuned for that. I think a Wizard 101 resurgence is inbound. We got this new single-player adventure prequel game, Ravenwood Academy, and the original game is finally being added to consoles. And there's a ton of stuff to look out for beyond that. I do think it's important that if we want to keep this game around, check out these projects when they come out. Ultimately, this is a smaller team, and it's important the game stays alive. They also got some merch and makeshift plushies if you're into that, but that's not important. We're talking about me now. I have a new makeshift pal p p p petition. There's a petition. We got to do the petition before the campaign. I want a marketable plushie. I thought this would be a good way to celebrate the end of this little Wizard 101 adventure. This is the first Chupo merch ever. So if you enjoyed this and want to make this a reality, you have until November 12th or the 13th, kind of depends on time zones, to support this petition. Make this a reality. Put in a couple bucks, you'll get a couple bucks off in the actual campaign. It would be so cool if you guys could help me out. I, I, they, please, 
Please, please. I'll make a FNAF video if this works out. Please. I'm serious. This is not a joke. This is the only way you're getting a FNAF video. I need this. This is actually also not a bit. I will, I will actually never make a FNAF video ever if this fails. This is your only chance you will ever get to get me to talk about FNAF lore. Ever. I am holding Freddy Fazbear hostage. And now back to the funny, silly video. As for Pirate 101, here's what I wanna do. Currently, the most popular Wizard 101 video is technically made by Moist Critical, going over the game's hacking crisis a few years back. I ignored going into detail about that whole situation because honestly, I don't really care about that, and there's more than enough videos on that situation already. If this project manages to beat that video in views, any of, any of the videos, I will 100% promise and guarantee a return to the spiral. I will do everything I've done here, but this time Pirate 101 story. The tale is incomplete. And if you guys want to see me, go ahead and do that. Finish the fight. You know, leave a comment, like the video, subscribe, share, all of that. Pirate 101 would be easier to do, but it's still not easy. And it could easily be a couple hours long in terms of a video. So yeah, that's all. I have officially reached the end of the bizarre lore of Wizard 101. And now, I'll be playing through all the Dark Souls games because after enduring all this shit, there's a very good chance I'm into masochism to some extent. So, bye.